Greetings. Welcome. My name is Mike Bankhead. I'm your host. I'm a bass player and songwriter from Dayton, Ohio. Hey, this is the second day in a row you get an episode of this podcast. I know, that's very strange. But it's a special week. Dayton Music Fest is this week. And I have a special guest, longtime Dayton musician Joe Anderl stops by, and we have a really nice conversation. It's a special one, folks, on the You Could Be My Aramis podcast. We're going to tell a lot of stories about the past. You're going to be able to hear easily just the passion for music that oozes out of Joe. Uh, He loves it so much. He loves playing. He loves going to shows. Uh, Yeah, I, I think you'll be able to tell that from our conversation. Let's get to it, shall we? Hey there, Joe Andrel. And Durrell. I should probably pronounce your name right. Um, and Earl. So it's like two people. Two Joe people. and Earl. <laughs> I, I'm glad you could take the time to talk to me. It's uh I really should have had you on really should have had you on sooner. Mike, it, you know, we've been friends for a long time and what you've been doing with this podcast and your own musical career and kind of pushing things forward. It, you know, it's awesome to see everything that you've been working on and, and moving towards and just supporting people around you. You know, you're a great example of a an independent musician who works hard. And so to talk to a fellow one, I truly appreciate that. Thanks. That's well, that's very nice of you, but you always say nice things. Uh, so for the people, like Dayton people who are in music are going to know who you are, but for people who are listening that might not, talk about yourself, Joe. <laughs> That was a hard question, Mike. Well, my name's Joe Andrew. I live in Dayton, Ohio. Um, Elaborate. I have a wife. I have three kids. And I love them all. I have two dogs. I also have been passionate about playing music for the last 26 years. Starting in high school. In a wonderful scene in the mid-90s in Dayton, Ohio. Um, moving to Athens, Ohio for college and continuing to play music. Moving back to Dayton, Ohio, and continuing to play music. I've had my fingers in a lot of different genres of music. I started, um, my first project was a high school ska band. Because all my best friends were in the marching band, and I wanted to be in a band with them. So that band was called the Krusty Watch Guys. I'm going to stop you for a bit, because I... And we've had this conversation between the two of us, but I'm going to let the listeners in on this. The Krusty Watch guys were uh, on the radio quite often. Back in the day, we used to have a radio station that would actually play local music, um, like one of the big radio stations. And I heard Krusty Watch Guy songs quite a bit on on the radio driving around. I was never really into ska, not my thing. But the Krusty Watch Guy songs always kind of made me smile. <laughs> they were <laughs> like a little cheeky, I guess. Is that it a good? Was so cheeky. Like, so we did a reunion like I don't know five years ago. It was it was the other guys in the band's twentieth high school reunion, and I'm like telling my wife, like, "Hey, you're gonna come see this," and I'm singing songs about air conditioning and internet lover because the internet didn't exist you know in 1990 well it did not the way it does now but internet yeah. lover is the one that i remember the most yeah meter http colon slash slash www.chainerchat.com it, it was cheeky but you know i wanted to be in a punk band like the know nothings from dayton ohio or the barn hills or um screeching weasel but all my friends were in marching bands so it's like how do you get your five best friends all in the same band right and it's like well let's start a ska band and they really embraced the ska side i embrace more of the punk side and it, but i mean it, it basically started i mean i think i started that band at 14, 15, Mike, and I'm 43. Yeah, and I don't think I knew you were in that band until like three or four years ago. <laughs> yeah, I was the singer. <laughs> so, um, yeah. The world is small sometimes. But it started this obsession with 
writing songs, playing music. And I realized that was like my joy in life, you know? And so to be able to continue to do that from that point to now, like I feel lucky. <laughs> so, I also don't know what else to do because it's always been my fun thing. <laughs> which, you know, I love music too, especially seeing it live. And it's just cool to go see a show and have the people on stage care about it as much, if not more, than the audience, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. You could say a lot of things about Mr. Joe Anderl. Apathetic is not something you can ever say about him. So you are there, currently... There have been moments, Mike, I would say. Oh, really? <laughs> I, I, haven't, I haven't seen those moments. No, I, I, will, I, I will give an anecdote of it, or a story of it. Okay, go. We're, we were asked to play a show um, out of town, and... It was basically the bartender and the promoter, right? And that night, I decided to see how many Bob Pollard leg kicks I could do in one night on stage. But no one was watching. So is, do you consider that apathetic? Because we still played hard, you know? We still did us. But I made a game out of it, you know? It feels like it seems like that'd be an easy way to hurt oneself. Um, yes, I was sore. <laughs> I mean, I'm not remotely as flexible as Bob Pollard. I'm not either. And I was holding a guitar while I was doing it. Yeah, that's even harder. The, the final count was 32. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> leg kicks. And, and they weren't like full Pollard, like all the way up leg kicks. It was just a leg kick on every chord, basically. <laughs> was this a, a 1984 draft show? It was. What year did you start the 1984 draft? That's an interesting question because it, the 84 draft has evolved. So it started in, we believe, 2000, sometime between 2008 and 2010 is when I started to transition the solo material to the 84 draft. Justin joined in 10-ish. To clarify, Justin would be your drummer. Yeah, Justin would be the drummer. And then we did years of, or a year or two of just a two-piece. Then we added Eli. And then we added Chip. And I might have this all wrong, but... I mean, we're at least 10 or 12. We'll have to go back through the uh, show dates to actually figure it out. But it started out as it was easier to book a solo show if they thought you were a band out of town. So I was doing an East Coast tour, changed the name, and all of a sudden three venues are like, cool, you know? They had no idea it was just one dude showing up. First of all, that's kind of unfair on the part of the venues. And second of all, that's very smart on your part. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, I mean, it was kind of the time of it. Like, so Mike Kinsella from Owen doesn't play as Mike Kinsella. He plays as Owen, right? It's, it sounds like it's a band. It could be a band. For me, the idea of the 84 draft was always... I wanted more people, but I just didn't have them yet. So I'm going to go play these songs and call myself the 1984 draft. And what we have done is kept the principle of, hey, if you can play a show, you can play a show. If you can't, you can't. So you can have people come in and out. So I think about you know, my Facebook memory from two two days ago was a date music fest at Gem City Records, which was just Justin and I. But Todd Widener came and joined us for two songs. We did a thing for um, NFL Films years ago, eight years ago now. And uh, 
Todd Widener played bass. Hey, this is Mike in post-production. We had some technical difficulties with the internet and some of the recording got messed up, but we recovered and the conversation continues. Now I'd like you to repeat like the last minute of that story <laughs> because I only got about half of your side of it. But you were talking about how the personnel can rotate in and out of the 1984 draft. Yeah, and that was how we were built. You know, it's like, if you have kids stuff to do, I will play solo. If, you know, we have to bring someone else in for a cool show, that's totally cool. It is 100% the way I uh, approached Chip and Eli to join the band. Which is, hey. You know, like, let's not make this high pressure. Let's just write songs, do cool stuff, play good shows, make records. If you're not available, that's okay. And so we have done that over the years. You know, I we just recently had one situation where I opened for Signals Midwest in Columbus. Great band originally from Cleveland, but a national band recorded record with Jay Robbins. And it was supposed to be just Justin and I, because that was who was available. And Justin ended up with COVID and I went and played solo. But we adjust as a band that way so much that it's like you're, if you, if you are in the draft, you're in the draft and you can make the choice on if you want to play or not. That's pretty laid back. It's difficult sometimes, but I know I have to show up, right? Yeah, yeah. You <laughs> you definitely uh, can't skip the show. You have a new record coming out. Uh, yeah. I want you to tell me about that. So we have a new record, Best Friends Forever. I tend to overthink records and have them planned out two years in advance. We have had this record for a long time, but then had to actually figure out the songs. And then at the very end of the recording process, always some song pops up, right? Best Friends Forever is... It's a time capsule for me, personally. It's, you know, where I'm sitting in life, where I'm sitting with my kids where we're sitting politically in America, it's actually the first record I kind of went after that. At least in one song. It's hard. It's hard to talk about it. Like this, as a musician, right, you want those time capsules of, hey, this is everything I lived through. And so it touches on COVID, it touches on corporate life, which is my day job. It touches on political life. And then touches on like my deep childhood feelings too. So it's for me, it's a perfect draft record because that's me as a human being. You had the distinction of having played every single Dayton Music Fest. Yes. <laughs> and you were about to play it again this weekend. Yes. I, I'd like you to talk about that, please. Dayton Music Fest has always been something special. Um, I remember when Andy, Dan, and Sean were putting it on in year one, right? And uh, I was like, I 100% want to be a part of it and did. And they were like, we want it to be like South by Southwest, where people can walk the streets, see bands for one night, you know? And that first year was absolutely amazing. And it has continued to be that way. 
it's a little, you know, post COVID is really hard for it. And, you know, I totally understand Nathan's position of two venues, right? You can't go up and down the street. The original principle was so awesome. So awesome. And I've used the card. Like, once you get into year seven or eight, you get to use the card of, like, hey, I've played every single one. Can I play it again? Even if you're not relevant. And I, I will admit I have done that. And I'm thankful that, you know, the various people who have run it through the years. So it was, let's go through this. Andy, Sean, Dan. And then it went to the Kyle, Don, Chris Wright era. Then it went to the um, oh Connor, or Connor Connor from who played in Speaking Sons ran it for a couple of years, and then Nathan took it over. The nice thing is it has been passed off nicely between people, and they continue to get great acts. I mean, Mike, you're playing with me tomorrow, right? Yeah. my uh, or Friday. Yeah. Well, yeah, Friday. And this is my first time playing. Uh, I've attended a lot, and it's one of my favorite events, and I'm just, like, just so stoked to be able to play it finally. Yeah, I mean, for years, we we have tried to do different things. So I've not only played it with the draft. You know, I've played it solo. I've played it with my previous projects. You know, we always try to make something special about it. Um, this year, we are doing record stuff, you know? So it's like, we're going to come just as ourselves, which is nice. Um, but just an amazing night to hang out with your fellow date musicians and share something, you know? Share something to be proud of. This is the portion of our conversation where we're going to invite people officially to come see us. Uh, this yes. podcast, uh, assuming I get the editing done tonight on time, which I am very motivated to do, will go up on Wednesday morning, the 19th. So someone could be listening to this on Wednesday, the 19th or Thursday, the 20th or Friday, the 21st. If you buy your ticket before Friday online, dear listener, uh, the Dayton Music Fest will only cost you $20, and that ticket will get you into both venues, Yellow Cab and Blind Bob's, on both Friday and Saturday. Uh, $25 at the door, so you save some money if you buy in advance. I'm sure Joe would like you to come see the 1984 draft on Friday at Yellow Cab. What time are you guys? 8.50. <laughs> now, the show starts at 6, and would we like you to come right when the show starts? Of course we would. We want you to see all of the musicians and get well, your money's worth. The, the nice part about that, Mike, is, you know, on Friday and Saturday at Yellow Cab, there's a Musicians in the Round, which is great singer-songwriters, including yourself. Um, yeah, that'll be fun. And it's different. It's something that it's never been done at Dayton Music Fest, and a great way to include singer-songwriters Plus, if you come to Yellow Cab at 6, Pizza Bandit's there, and they have a special pizza this weekend. Yeah, why so cheesy? Six <laughs> cheeses, and 10% of all their uh, proceeds are going to go to WISO, uh, our beloved NPR affiliate out of Yellow Springs, who are a co-sponsor of Dayton Music Fest this year. We like them because they really support Dayton musicians. They play our songs on the radio, and it, it means a lot to us. Absolutely. And, I mean, I mean, as rad as Wiseau is, I do have to give my shout-out to WDR and Art Gibson. Always. He, he also supports in that same way. And so, you know, we are lucky as Dayton musicians to have local radio play our songs. Yes, in a lot of places that doesn't happen. Yep. Which is, you know, a cry and shame because I'm sure that every town has their share of decent songwriters and people that really care and make music and it's 
they don't get ears on their music because nobody will play their music. But at least here in Dayton, we have a way to get our music out to people. And uh, WUDR as, uh, with Dr. J, as, as Joe mentioned, and also WISO, uh, those are the local stations that play most of us. Yeah, and I mean, but I mean, we can talk about venues too. Like Dayton is super supportive of independent music. Yes. All around. More so than many, many other cities, especially cities of our size. Well, I mean, I don't even think Cincinnati is as supportive of like new and up and coming, right? Probably like, not. It's what we have going on in Dayton is special. We have amazing venues, amazing venue owners. You know, and I know that, you know, for Dayton Music Fest, Yellow Cab and Blind Bobs are involved. And Bob and Lisa from Blind Bobs are two of the most special people because they cared from the moment they opened. They reached out to my myself, my brother. They were like, how do we bring the bands in, right? And we were like, do what you're doing and we'll support, we'll come behind you. Because there was some scariness, right? Because we had elbows and, you know, night owl going on. And so it was scary for independent bands. But Blind Bobs has become a safe haven to the entire Midwest. Like in how they treat the bands and how they do things. Same thing with Yellow Cap. You know, giving you know, not only Dayton musician space, but national musician space to come and play. Amazing work by both of those venues. And I think the key thing you said is that they care. Yeah. They treat they treat the musicians that play there fairly. And so, uh, I mean, this is an example, dear listener. You might not know this is a thing, but in, in many venues in this country, when you sell merchandise at a show, the people that run the establishment will take a cut of your sales. That's not cool. <laughs> Especially, you know, making making music doesn't really go that far toward paying the bills. And selling merchandise is the highest profit margin that we have as independent musicians. Mm. And for a venue to say you can't sell merchandise here without giving us a percentage of it, that is awful tough. Yeah. And, you know, I've been lucky enough that both venues have, you know, concession to sound guy. Yeah. On occasion where, you know, you like, cause I'm also an independent promoter, right? I do my own shows. I don't go through people. I just tend to, I mean, aside from, you know, shows where I'm asked to play, right? Yep. Um, they're very generous in those situations if you work them out in advance. Yeah. And, you know, most of the people that attend the show don't think about these things, right? But somebody has to run the mixer to make sure everything sounds good. And that yep. person needs to be paid for their time. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Because it's, because it's work and those are talented professionals, right? Uh, so what basically what we're saying is these are two venues in our town that support local musicians by allowing us to walk away from a show there having... With with some money to take home. Well, not lost something yet. <laughs> yeah. yeah, having yeah, we can play a show and not come out of there in the red, which yep. is a lot of musicians and a lot of cities can't say that yep. about the places they play. Especially if you're trying to self promote it, you know. Yeah. Yep. All told, if you're a musician in our town. You probably already know this. Uh, if you're not playing Dayton Music Fest, reach out to Nathan Peters and then try to get on the bill for next year. At least let him know who you are and what kind of music you make. Dear listeners, this is a long time now, for many years now, my favorite local music event. You pay one low, low price. I sound like a car salesman now, but you pay one low, low price and you get to see... You know, a couple dozen bands across two days. And there's not a lot of places that your $20 will go that far. So 
come see us. Come see me at six o'clock at Yellow Cab on uh, on Friday the twenty first. Come see Joe Anderl in the nineteen eighty four draft at eight fifty at Yellow Cab. Same Friday. Go, same Friday. Go see a whole lot of different bands, both on Friday and on Saturday, both at Yellow Cab and at Blind Bob's. There's there's something there for everyone. Well, and if they're in an, in an aspiring band, like come talk to us. Yes. You know, like if if you think your band aligns with the 1984 draft, come tell me. You know, and if you like what we're doing, come tell me. And you know, we're always looking for younger bands to open shows that we're working on, you know. Um we would love to have that conversation and just encourage you in con- continuing to play awesome music, you know? That's pretty cool. That's that's a good point. Uh, hey, it's a tad people, wider people don't, thing. People don't need to be afraid of you. <laughs> it, it's Joe's a tad very wider nice. thing for me. It is. You know, you know it's it, so Todd is an old Dayton guy, but he never made me feel fearful of him. And encouraged me on. He actually is has been a member of the draft. <laughs> but it's like if you're making music, we're all part of the same family. And if you're making music in Dayton, we're all part of the same family. So there's no one too big or too small that you can't talk to. And you know, if you if you want to try to hear a band a show, just ask. It's literally just asking sometimes. And half the time it's no, but sometimes it's yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe that no isn't so much no as not right now. Yeah, yeah I mean, definitely. The no is not right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not never. <laughs> yeah, no, not at all. I mean, Mike, we, we are going to figure out a place for us to play together. We oh, yeah, are aside from Dave Music Fest. Right. Um, and I would like to figure that out when I can recruit a band so I can be loud. Uh, <laughs> because you guys are loud, and I feel like if I'm gonna play with the nineteen eighty four draft, I need to at least approach your volume level. Yeah, we're we're loud. <laughs> yeah, definitely folks bring your bring your earplugs for, for Dayton Music Fest. And they have them by the door at Yellow Cab Tavern. They they do give away they do give away earplugs for those that, that did not bring their own. Um so, not to embarrass you, Joe, but one of the things that my wife and I always say when we go see a show, this is to illustrate to the listeners that you care, that it's not a 1984 draft show until Joe breaks down in tears. <laughs> because inevitably, at some point during your set, you cry. And it's like every time. And I'm not, no. this is not a bad thing. There, there's, I mean, we're songwriters. We, we know how to be emotional. But you can't go to, a, to one of your shows and walk away thinking that, okay, this person doesn't care or they're not into what they're doing. Um, because Joe will not only sing his heart out, uh, he will also drip tears down all over that stage. That's not true. I don't cry at every show. I cannot remember the last time I saw you do an 84 draft show where you did not cry at some point. <laughs> now, I'm not, well, I'm not the, saying that you need to stop crying. The last has been really intense, but I, can I tell you a story about my kid and said? You can. So um, my wife works in a school system, and our son actually goes to school with her there because he can go to all-day kindergarten. And uh, she was having a, a rough physical day and need to take a nap when she got home. And so we let him watch videos. And uh, he kept pulling up this like slow song with dogs on it, kind of like the Sarah McLaughlin uh, video for dogs. But it wasn't that. And I was still on work calls. And so we were trying to balance that. And I think the third time I heard it, I just walked away, went to my son, and he was crying. And he was watching sad music with puppies. (laughs) And just in tears. 
And I think for me, as a, he's five, it was like, well, number one, that's my son. <laughs> you know, when you see something that's so cute or so beautiful, like you have that emotion. And even in my own shows, yes, I will cry because it is so beautiful. When the audience participates, when your friends show up, when people are engaged, like, yes, I will cry. I I will, like, because I'm lucky, right? Not everyone gets to be a songwriter. Not everyone gets to put out records. Not everyone gets to break even on their records. Not everyone gets to play bigger shows. Not everyone gets to do all these things. Like, I know where I'm sitting. And I am. Mike, were you trying to make me cry? I I was not, but it's okay if you do. I don't mind. Because that's where I'm feeling it. It's like. It's just true thankfulness. And that's really what it is. Yeah. Well, and, and a, it's no joke. We like, get to share. We get to share something that's really important to us with other people. And you're correct. Not everyone gets to do that. No. No, we don't. And so when it's special, it's special. And, and yes, I'm going to lose it. You know? Well, I'm going to so lose good. it. I'm going to cry. And even talking about you know, playing music for this long makes me feel that way. It has been so special to my life. It's been my fun thing. It's been my healing thing. It's been more than I would have ever asked when I was a ska band at 15. Once again, thank you very much to Joe Anderl for stopping by and having that conversation. Hey, You can see him and the 1984 draft this Friday, 21st October at Yellow Cab, like we talked about on this episode. This is Dayton Music Fest weekend, and we'd really like to see you out there at the show. Speaking personally, I'm on at 6 on Friday the 21st. I also have brand new merchandise for you, hoodies and t-shirts. And, you know, since... We had the special guest from the 1984 draft here. I think it's only appropriate to take you out of the podcast today with the 1984 draft song. This is from their, oh, I think this album came out in 2015, maybe. It's an EP called Heisman Trophy Winner. And this is track one on that CD, which I'm holding in my hands. It's called Capo. Thank you very much for listening. And I really hope to see you this weekend at Dayton Music Fest. Well, I got a whole lot of nothing from the last time I saw your I got a whole lot of something when I saw that you were lying to my face in the red haired swimming and I swear that I'm walking away no I don't want to change my mind I don't want to change my mind I don't want to change